Once a year, all construction in China stops so that the university hopefuls can take their national exams. This would not happen in Germany. So is education in Asia more important than in the West? Glad to have you here at Asia Talk in Beijing's art district Xichou Bar 798. The race for knowledge. Do Asians study too hard and are Westerners too lazy? How does fierce competition affect people here? Are young Westerners really more creative than Asians? And are Asians nothing but copycats? My guest today knows this topic like nobody else, a German who for years has been the dean of Shanghai CEIBS, which is one of the leading business schools in Asia. A warm welcome to Professor Rolf Krämer. Pleasure, Rolf, to meet you here. Pleasure to meet you. You are a professor for economics, so therefore you're quite right in China, <laughs> and you uh, you have been the head of CEIBS since 2004, the dean. You got your doctorate in Germany, and in Darmstadt, in a German university, but you moved to China quite early in 82 and stayed there for a while, building a similar business school than the one you're leading today. Then you left for New Zealand and you stayed there for about 10 years before you actually decided in 2003 to come back to Shanghai into the bad pollution. Why did you decide so? When I was a very young man and uh, my, my sport was rowing at the time, uh, I always thought that the place to be was New York. I never made it to New York, but I made it to Shanghai eventually uh, from 82 then went to New Zealand and found that uh, after eight, nine, ten years in New Zealand that New Zealand is a very small, quite a very small population base. It's a very remote place and I wanted to be back in China because this is really where the music plays. This is where the, where the heartbeat of the world economy today is. What do we have to expect? You know your students, in which way on your business school the Chinese students are different than the Western students? They are different, but it is a different by degree, uh, not, uh, a, not a fundamental difference. There are, uh, th there are images or cliches uh, in the West about how Chinese people in general, Chinese students in particular, uh, uh, may work and may study. So they're less creative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More, yeah. This idea that, that, that they can copy. We have seen this uh, as a cliché copycats. towards copycats. We have seen this as a cliché against the, uh, the Japanese as well. And, you know, see where we are today. Uh, to think that the Chinese can only copy is uh, falling well short of reality. They're brilliant people here and well-educated, particularly in science and technology. But they are different. But there are differences of degree in the way, for example, students learn. Uh, this, one can experience uh, this quite well in, in the school, in the business school, where we have something like 40% uh, non-Chinese student uh, students at CIBS, and they work together in study groups. Five or six to one group, always mixed groups, Chinese and foreign and so forth. And they experience, when they work together, different work and study patterns during the day. The Chinese students, with no difficulty, learn and study and read and discuss until you know, 8, 10, 12, 2, 4 o'clock at night. Uh, the international students, when it gets to 8 or 10, uh, also sometimes have other priorities. Well, it's I told, a different you, I way told you, they are lazy. 
No, it is a different. It is a different way of working. Um, the I think that the uh, the international students that we have uh, separate work from leisure quite clearly. When they work, they work quite hard. They're very concentrated, very intensive. The Chinese way of learning still, but it is only a matter of degree. It's not a fundamental difference. We should not exaggerate this. Learn more, learn more extensively. One could say it is less efficient, but it is equally effective. What was in your mind when you thought in New Zealand about um, China? Was there a certain event you remembered and which kept you thinking about China? It's, uh, it, it's two things, really. It's one, I, I do have a, um, a, a deep affection for this country, uh, for China and its people, which uh, developed very early 80, in the early 80s. Uh, but it is also that uh, I was fascinated by uh, the changes that are emerging, coming out of China. And yes, I, I do um, remember an occasion where, when I think I understood what uh, people uh, brighter than myself, like Deng Xiaoping, uh, saw much earlier. I hadn't seen this in the beginning. What but was it? Uh, I was at the time uh, in Macau, and uh, on, a, uh, on a Sunday morning in September 85, I took a walk across the, the Taipa Bridge in Macau, which is a peculiar, a special construction. And I was walking with sunshine, beautiful morning, nobody there apart from myself. And so I was walking on that bridge and I came to the top of that bridge and uh, towards me uh, came a, a motorcycle, a small motorcycle, 50cc, uh, full throttle up that steep incline. <laughs> and uh, on the, and th this uh, little thing, which this little anecdote I'm telling is changed my view or opened my eye for what was happening. On the motorcycle was um, on the motorcycle was a well I would th thought was a construction worker he had a blue construction worker's helmet uh, getting up this steep incline and was smiling at me is, he was not very far away the, the, the motorcycle was very slow between his arms uh, was a little girl five six years old uh, with uh, floating devices on her arms. Uh, holding on for dear life to the to the handlebar also laughing behind him uh, was a, a young woman presumably his wife was a, were holding him and looked towards me as well and was also obviously happy and smiling had a picnic basket on, on one of her arms and i think at, it was at that moment that i suddenly understood what was happening around me in China uh, because I had a very clear idea where these people were going. They were going to the beach. The beach in, in Macau is further south on one of the outlying islands, very nice uh, places there. And it was so clear to me that here was a young man, a worker, 25 years old, whatever. He had saved a little of money, bought himself a spanking new motorbike and he took his little young family to the beach. And it was a special beach. It was the beach where, for the last three, four, 450 years, mostly, if not only, Portuguese uh, administrators, colonial administrators, no particular criticism intended there, but it was their beach. It was the beach of the establishment, and the establishment there with the colonial administrators. And this young man wanted to take his family to a place in the sun and he wanted it now and he enjoyed it and he was ready to work for it. So it and I thought, struck you like a lightning. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> a revelation. I thought not only of this man, but I thought, oh my God, he is not the only one. There's another <laughs> 1.3 billion people north of here and they all, to stay in the picture, they all want to take their families to the beach right now not in 50 years. And I found this immediately totally understandable, totally natural. Sounds a bit scary legitimate. from a Western point of view. We have to get used to the idea that 
the peculiar situation that we have had in the past 200 to 250 years, where Europe and the United States a little later got so far ahead, where 10% of the world's population got so far ahead of the rest of the world's population, that that distance is going to close in the future. And there is no way, neither morally nor objectively or technically, to stop this. And it, it, it is not an entirely comfortable thought. So no, uh, no way to fight yourself through as a Westerner? I see no, no reason for cultural pessimism. Uh, I mean, civilizations have come, come and gone, but I don't see... But when the, the own <laughs> civilization is going down the drain, that's not very good news. That Europe is far from going down the drain. One reads this occasionally uh, and it may, may sell well as a book or something, but I don't, uh, I don't really think that there's very good reason to see this. Take an example. Uh, the United States uh, integrated themselves, moved, moved themselves into the world community, into the world uh, economy forcefully, by now is clearly the strongest military, uh, economic, uh, technological, etc. force. And I can't see uh, any serious reason to think that this has been bad for Europe or for anybody else. But there's a big difference. America was from emerging from the same cultural roots, whereas uh, China is completely different. They have different values, they have different idea of how they live together. So this change should be much deeper than the change uh, which came with the emerge of America. Um, I don't think that the change is, I wouldn't say that the change is deeper or more drastic, um, but it is a little, it may be a little bit more difficult to manage and to accept uh, because of the cultural differences, because of the perception of these people, the Asians, the Chinese, being different, looking different, speaking a language that uh, many people find so difficult to learn. Uh, but it, it is possible and it, it has to be possible. What are the differences? The differences are differences uh, of, of degree, uh, I think. The, the, the perception of fundamental difference is stronger than the actual differences. The, uh, the, what we, as I said, in, uh, as I try to illustrate with the example on, of the man on the, on the motorcycle, the, the dreams of that man and his little family are quite comparable to the dreams of, uh, say, uh, German soldiers uh, returning after World War II from the battlefield, um, where, who also wanted to rebuild, live in peace, have a family, have some children. And now we and got lazy? No, I wouldn't say lazy. Uh, but it is, it's, it's getting harder. It's getting harder and uh, we, we may have uh, to consider that our advantages, our competitive advantages in terms of um, education, technology, etc. may not be large enough to justify uh, or to bridge the gap between working, say, 1,500 hours a, a year as compared to two and a half thousand or 2,800 hours a year. That is a big, big gap. So, so we we're going to lose other. market share and political importance, political uh, power. Surely we are going to lose market share, of course. Uh, if uh, if uh, China is moves itself, integrates itself into the world economy. This, is, this means a smaller market share, but it doesn't mean a smaller market. We also lost, in my pre as I said previously, surely we have uh, lost, Europeans have lost market share to the Americans in, uh, in many industries, but that doesn't mean that we haven't had economic growth. This is not a zero-sum game. We will see in China, surely, uh, increasing living standards. We see this in the pro more prosperous areas uh, of eastern China already. We see rising wages, etc. So this is coming up. And with that, the competitive gap is narrowing there as well. I think we should... L let me first mm -hmm. try to 
use an image of what I think would actually be appropriate. This is not going to happen that fast, but I think it would be appropriate. I think it would be appropriate for Western leaders, Chancellor Merkel, uh, President Sarkozy, um, Gordon Brown, Obama, to say on primetime TV in China, Mr. President Hu Jintao, uh, Prime Minister Wen Jiabao, dear Chinese friends and citizens, uh, I tip my hat at what you have achieved. I respect very much what you have achieved. So let's work together. There are problems, but let's work together. This has not happened yet. So why? It hasn't, it hasn't happened because the perception of the threat may be stronger than the willingness to understand and accept the necessity of accepting this. That's bad news. This means it, it is bad news, um, but it only defines, it only illustrates that we have a quite specific, quite, uh, yeah, quite specific task ahead of us. We need to understand in the West where China comes from, where they are going, and that it is totally legitimate and unstoppable. And the Chinese themselves have to accept that they have to explain themselves overseas. Which they don't do right now. No, Why I do think they that's think right. that we have to learn how they going to work, how they think, and they don't have the idea that they have to explain themselves? Uh, I think there may be s several uh, explanations from this. Uh, maybe uh, I could offer two. One is that the Chinese, some Chinese in some circles, there may still be a perception that they have been very unfairly treated in the past and therefore can expect that the West, that the uh, developed world is more accommodating, that they feel s sort of guilty about this and uh, should welcome them back more forcefully, more actively. That, I don't think that that thought is gaining ground. I think it's getting weaker. But there may be an expectation that the West owes China a grand welcome of some sort. Would you say this is right? Do we owe China? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, the, the, the time, I think one has to see the... Um, the time that has passed, uh, China rose as a civilization 2,000, two and a half thousand years ago to its, its heyday uh, in the Song and Tang dynasties and then declined. Not only because of external factors and the intervention of foreign nations, but also because of its internal erosion of the, uh, of the decadence that was... was uh, uh, um, gaining ground. So it was on its way down for centuries. To, to, lay, the, to lay the blame for this to, a, to, to the West in general or to a particular action, a particular war, is a little bit short. But it is part of this and may explain some of this, uh, of this reluctance. The other part is that China doesn't... It, it's a two-way thing. The, the, the West doesn't know much about China. That the, that the ignorance about China, about Chinese history, culture, civilization, about Chinese people, Chinese language overseas is appalling. How about the role of uh, the professors coming from abroad and telling the Chinese how the world is going <laughs> to run? Uh, is this ex still acceptable? Was it acceptable at the beginning? Uh, I think that in the, uh, the changing role of foreign or foreign trained professors is one of the uh, most remarkable shifts in business education and probably beyond business education that we have seen in the last uh, 30 years. Uh, I, I recall vividly when I came to China first in, in 82 as a, as a very young uh, academic with probably not much to offer, 
uh, I felt uh, I felt treated like a like a demigod almost. You know, I, I was appreciated. And you liked it. I liked it, of course, and wrote letters bound. You can't believe, folks, <laughs> how wonderful this is. Little king. To be, a, to be a teacher in China. The students are willing to learn, they don't critique you, they don't interrupt you, this is all very, very nice. Uh, so foreign professors had a big advantage walking into the classroom. This went to, the, this went to very quite absurd extents, uh, to extents. Chinese colleagues had problems being accepted by business students. They were seen as not be, they were assumed, presumed, not to be up to the play, not be up to standard. Now, and I think that that process started five to ten years ago, in this strong momentum, it is almost the other way around. It is now more difficult to be accepted as a foreigner in the classroom because the assumption, the presumption now is rather. This is a foreigner, he may know things that are relevant, this is a slightly different argument, that are relevant uh, in Europe or in the United States or somewhere else, but it cannot be possibly be to China. We are different, this is China and therefore they don't have the relevant background to this. So, so it's so more difficult now for foreign professors. So we ta taught them how to deal with international business and now they try to get rid of us. Is this a happy ending? <laughs> I find it hard to share that, uh, that perspective on things. Why? We, our, our ideas of uh, democracy, of equality, of uh, human development, of economic development cannot stop at our national boundaries. Uh, the, the idea to develop other countries, other nations, to help them develop in a non-zero-sum game where rising tide lifts all boats is a genuinely positive task. Eventually, the Chinese will be able to take over most of the things they need in their own country themselves and work on eye level with foreigners. The idea that we as foreigners could or let alone should dominate key positions in their education system or anywhere else in their system seems to me to be very hard to uh, justify. I think the burden of proof is with those who, are, who advocate that. So you have to be <laughs> replaced soon? No, not so soon. Uh, the, in, in management education, the business schools, the domestic Chinese business schools, although they are making very good progress, still have a very long, very long way to go. I would think, uh, I, I try, let me illustrate this. Uh, we recruit faculty, we have at CIBS now about 57, 58 permanent professors. All but four or five of those, no more than that, have, uh, have been recruited from overseas. Many of them, 75%, 80% of them are ethnically Chinese, but maybe US citizens, Canadian citizens, German, British, whatever citizens, European citizens. They have a level of knowledge and expertise that is not available from within the domestic system in China yet. It will take an academic generation, 15, 20 years for that to be Until different. we can uh, mention an Asian business school on the same level as Harvard, as in Seat and others. London yes, School correct. of Economics. Correct. Uh, there is, um, I think it has to be, for China, the objective has to be to have a handful, four, five, six business schools that are respected members of the top league of business schools internationally. So that the idea is not that the Chinese can manufacture them very well. You can go to China and study at a first class business school at the moment that is possible at, uh, at CIBS because it is an international, a Sino-International Business School, but not yet really 
in the domestic business schools. 15, 20 years, I think. So that's kind of good news. So we have still a few years to get uh, to stay competitive. It means that for the next uh, 15, 20 years, there is still a development task uh, that um, is very attractive, uh, that is worth doing, needs to be done. But after that, the world doesn't end either. You know, after that, we have partners throughout the system at the same level. And I cannot see that this is for any disadvantage. We are running out of time. Thanks for being here, Rolf. Um, and I wish you that you can stay as a Westerner in your position for quite a while. And don't forget, as the Chinese are saying, Manzor, walk slowly. <laughs>